Hello, I'm Ryan Feeney, and welcome to the Queen's University Shaping a Better World podcast. We recorded this podcast on Election Day in Northern Ireland, 5th of May, with world-renowned political consultant and poster, Dr. Frank Luntz. Just before you commence the interview, I want to assure listeners I was smiling. Thanks to the public engagement team, and in particular, Dr. Morris McCartney, for producing this podcast. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Queen's University's Shaping a Better World podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Frank Luntz, a man who needs no introduction. Political commentator, academic, well-known consultant to our favourite TV show, The West Wing. Dr. Luntz is in Northern Ireland for a number of days and has agreed to do this podcast here at Queen. So, Frank, you're very welcome to Queen's University. I love the idea, a man who needs no introduction, and then you give me an introduction. That's exactly it. There's, a, there's actually a good TV show called He Needs No Introduction, um, and, and uh, so it works out particularly well. But anyway, Frank, we're delighted to have you here, and thank you for travelling uh, over to Northern Ireland. We're recording this on Election Day, so it's particularly prevalent that we have Frank here, and he'll give us some of his views on the election uh, over uh, the next half hour. So, Frank, you're a well-known political analyst. You're a pundit in the United States. You've worked on this side of the Atlantic. You've worked with... Uh, political parties in Dublin, you've worked across the UK, but for those who might be less familiar with your work, can you give us a bit of a background in terms of your biography? So my focus is on language, and I picked this up back in 1994 when I worked for Newt Gingrich, 93 when I worked for Rudy Giuliani, when he was actually a respected mayor of, uh, mayor candidate of New York, and even back in 92 with Ross Perot. But my attention is language, so I listen to your questions, I listen to every word, I listen to or I look at the fact that you're nodding at me right now. I don't know if, if we'll be able to see the visual of this. Mm-hmm. You've got a tie. I don't. Your shirt is perfectly pressed. Mine is not. Uh, I smile a lot. Or I, at least I used to. You don't. Uh, it, it's Everything is about communications, about getting across an idea, a concept, a principle, a priority. And that's been my focus for the last uh, 30 years. So... People will know you as a pollster, and um, at the top of your Twitter account, you rightly predicted, it's it's pinned there, you rightly predicted how the presidential election would go in uh, 2019. You called it completely right from the point of view that Trump was going to surge at the start, but then when postal votes came in, we were going to have a couple of days where Biden would come back, and a lot of people wrote off that view, um, but it actually ended up being true. And by the way... Them running that off is what caused the problem today. Mm-hmm. That I think of all the events in my lifetime, what happened in the in election day and in the three four days afterward is what led to January sixth. It's what led to the former president being able to claim that he won the election, which he did not, and there is a hundred percent evidence that he did not. But the media did not understand and did not explain to the public how this would look, allowing the president, the former president, to claim that these votes are being, and I quote, dumped. So there are millions of Trump people who are actually in their heads thinking that all these ballots were made up, that that this was falsified, and this was going to happen based on how people voted, when they voted, and how those votes were were, uh, counted. Never allow your system to make that mistake. Never allow any country to not fully explain to voters how votes are counted, how they are cast, and what is likely to take place. And I regret not screaming it from the rooftops because that has caused us a whole lot of pain and heartache democratically over the last uh, 15 months. And do you think that there's any attempt um, to try and streamline or reform the system, or is it politically expedient to keep it as it is? I don't see any reason to reform it, because it allowed people to vote any way they wanted to. I don't, you have to vote on election day here, correct? Yeah. We don't. You can vote a week before, 10 days before, two weeks before. In some states, you can vote a month before, any day you want to vote. You all can't cast ballots in different places. We can. The American system allows more people to participate their own way, either through early voting or absentee voting or day of of, um, election voting, than any any other country. This idea that there is voter suppression, if you can't get your act together, 
No matter what state you live in, if you can't get your act together to vote based on American election laws, you're pathetic, and maybe you shouldn't be engaged in this system. I, I want everyone to vote, but I don't want everyone to lie. And it's the one aspect of the American political process. There's only a couple that I truly think work. One of them is giving everyone access, and the other is our debates that we host in September and October between the main candidates. And in that case, you have Trump once again upsetting the system by pulling the Republican Party out and participating. Our system is a mess. Our population is divided. Our, everyone in society is polarized. We condemn rather than empathize. We uh, cancel rather than embrace. And it has humbled me over the last 20 years. So when I go to foreign countries and get to watch their elections, as I will do later today, I don't want you to follow the American system because the American system is broken. You did a bit of work in Australia along with Kevin Rudd, and the Australian system uh, focuses on you have to vote. Uh, everyone legally has to vote, and you can abstain by putting a cross on the ballot, but you vote or you get fined. Is that a good system? No, or? no because part of the process of an election is participation. And if somebody doesn't want to participate, and I hear the line, I don't want to encourage them. If I vote, it just encourages them. They should have that right. You should have the right to vote for anyone you want. You should have the right not to vote if you don't want to. Don't tell people what they have to do because that's a better measurement of how they think, how they feel, and what they want for the future. So in terms of political communications, which is obviously a key part of your overall portfolio, you have a book called Words That Work. It's not what you say, it's what people hear. How do you get words to work? Uh, you famously, uh, on several occasions, changed the vernacular in the American political discourse to the benefit of the Republican Party and others. What's the philosophy behind that? And how subtle can a small change in vernacular be to actually get in the community or the population at large to back an idea? Well, you tell me. It, they used to call soft drinks. They used to say that they were carbonated, and now they're sparkling. Mm -hmm. Which would you rather drink? Uh, carbonated suggests chemicals. Sparkling suggests a taste. Gaming is what it's called now. It used to be called gambling. Gambling's got a negative connotation to it. Gaming can be a whole lot of different things, and it's about enjoyment. It's about the experience. Uh, the death tax rather than the estate tax moving from focusing on how wealthy someone is to focusing on the fact that you're taxed simply because you die. You don't get people to embrace the words, you get the words that people embrace. Just to quote you, 80% um, of our life is emotion and only 20% is intellect. Um, you've emphasized, interestingly, that it's about what people feel and you've alluded to that already. Um, how do we motivate people more in terms of politics? Um, one of the things that you've indicated in the discussions that we've had prior to this is that there is massive turnout now in the United States. People are actually voting again. We will have about a 60%, 65% turnout today uh, in our local assembly elections. And there's a whole raft of reasons behind that. We had a, a bit of a, a peak in terms of 2017 and, and Brexit probably had an impact on that. But how do we use language to get people passionate about politics again? Well, the emotion, and I'm a personal example of this, on my way in from the airport, my taxi driver did not want to talk politics with me, and I tried to bring it up, and he was clear this is not a conversation until we got to the city limits, and we're heading towards a bridge, and he turns and says to me, can I have a conversation with you just between us? I said, sure. And he said, do you see that bridge over there? He said, I said, yes. He says, my father was killed on that bridge. My father was gunned down. He was murdered uh, by a, um, and this gentleman was Catholic, and he was murdered by a, what I call a vigilante. I don't know what the term is over here. But he's describing me the story. He was seven years old at the time, and about 10, 15 years later, he came and met the guy who killed his father. And I'm attempting to retell this story to the gentleman who's checking me in at the, air, at the hotel, and I can't get through the story. Mm -hmm. 
It's now been 24 hours, so I've processed it, so I'm not emotional now. But you could tell me about all the people who were killed during the troubles. You can tell me how bad it was. Nothing will have an impact on a human being. Like someone that you see, someone that you're talking to, who tells you that story of their own life. And that's actually communication at its best. It's not in a book. It's not impersonal. This is a real person who went through hell and how he recovers from it and how he processes it, processes it and how he looks back at it. And I try to help policies and people capture that same kind of emotion in how they communicate. But hopefully they don't do to the audience is what this guy did to me. I mean, I mean, he just broke me up. And even when I got there yesterday to have this uh, session, I was still a mess. And you greeted me. And you, don't, you won't know it because I was about to tell the story again. And then I met a colleague of yours who was actually on the signatory of the Good Friday Agreement. Professor Monica McWilliams. That completely changed the conversation. I got away from it and everything was fine. But that story and the personalization of it and the fact that more than half the people that are sitting around the table yesterday had family members or friends who lost someone because there's nothing more final than death. That's the power of a mode of communication. So it's fair to say, Frank, that you've been more associated with the conservative side of the spectrum in terms of your work over the last uh, number of decades in Northern Ireland and presumably elsewhere, <coughs> the conservative message doesn't seem to resonate with young people. And we see that here. We're recording this in the university. Um, our students, and we had this discussion last night, are more relaxed about you know, the bigger issues, but their focus is on gender and sexual orientation, ethnic diversity, the environment. Um, they are quite animated and focused and uh, have a, a, a passion for, for those issues. Conservatives on occasion can dismiss these views as wokery or um, something that they see as, as additional to, to the main focus of politics. How do we actually get more young people to think about the bigger issues? And are we witnessing a bit of a generational change in terms of, of <coughs> politics and the old right and left dichotomy? Uh, absolutely. I don't think our politics is going to go back to where it was before COVID. In America, half the country has changed their life, lifestyle. A third of the country is either changing where they work or how they work. A quarter of the country is changing where they live or how they live. 20% have changed their friends, even 13% have changed how they vote. It's a fundamental shakeup. It's my job to communicate that, and it's not a resignation. In America, we call it the great resignation, and that is not accurate. It's a great rethink. As we decide what matters to us, what matters to our families, what we prioritize in life. And resignation is just about our jobs. And there aren't all that many people who put their job over everything else in their lives. So that's part of the change. The second part is to remind people, particularly at a university, that the most important diversity isn't your skin color or the fact that you wear a tie or the fact that you've got a cotton shirt rather than my polyester. The most important diversity is intellectual. It's ideas. And that should be welcomed and embraced. And what I hope to do with this university later today is to emphasize and even tell people you want to be around people you disagree with. It makes life so much more interesting. It'll make going out to the pub so much more enjoyable. You have a great argument. You have a drink or two or five. Don't drive. And you leave as friends. What is so difficult about sitting with someone who you fundamentally disagree with you. You care what their religion is, but you don't care how they think and their values and, and understanding that. I just, I don't understand. I, I, in fact, not only do I not understand it, I reject it. And I blame, frankly, a lot of the faculty. I teach all over the globe. You know how much I wanted to be here. I tried to light a spark 
sit next to someone at your next meal who you don't know and isn't from your country. Have a conversation tonight with someone who doesn't look like you at all. Go out of your way to broaden your perspectives and you will have a much more interesting life. Tragically, there are way too many faculty members, at least in American universities and in UK universities, that actually intimidate students to be silent. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. You should be encouraging those who you may disagree with. We know the faculty is a far left of center, or just left of center. Great. That's fine. That's okay. Your right of center students should be as free to speak and as comfortable and secure that not only will they not be punished, but they'll be rewarded for speaking out. It doesn't happen. So in terms of communications and political communications, A, how do we communicate better with young people? But B, is it positivity that works or is it negativity that yields better results? Unfortunately, over 50% of 18 to 24-year-olds have canceled a friend, a former friend, because they simply disagree with them and they don't want to hear their point of view. Compare that to their parents, where it's about 25%, and their grandparents, where it's about 14%. Young people are the most likely to want to hang out with other people whom they agree with than any other generation, which is a tragedy. And the only way that we're going to get beyond that is to teach them the joy of a different perspective. Um, I promise on the right, there are people who voted for Donald Trump that think I'm a traitor. There are those who voted for Joe Biden who think I'm evil. That if you try to take a consensus approach, if you try to bring people together, neither side appreciates that. And in fact, both sides will try to punish you for doing it. And I went through that. It's one of the reasons why I spent eight months last year in the UK. And I was over here during that period. I, I had become very critical of former President Trump for his language, for his messaging, for how he condemns anyone who speaks against him. If you dare challenge him at anything, you're a traitor or his people think you're a traitor. And I think that's really bad for democracy. It's really bad for politics. Uh, I worked on the COVID vaccine with the Biden White House. I worked on an attempt to get uh, a consensus on immigration. And on climate, I actually came to COP26 in Scotland and briefed John Kerry. So many people on the left either don't know that or don't care, but isn't that what they want? Mm -hmm. The idea that people can transition through politics and can transform a discussion based on ideas and, and, and language and priorities. Um, but instead of being rewarded, I was punished. And it really has left uh, an impact on me. So let's go back to polls. And by the way... It's the reason why yesterday you saw me ask every person around that room a question. I'm not just here to impart information. I really want to learn. Mm -hmm. I want to hear the perspective. Uh, I, and, and I'm so curious about it. And last night it was difficult for me to sleep because there's so many questions I have. And, so, and I want to instill that in the next generation. I want to do the opposite of shutting them up. I want them to be so eager that when they wake up in the morning, they're excited, that they're energized, that they're thinking every day should be a jigsaw puzzle and every day is a new one and every day you've got to put all the pieces together and some days you don't. Some days by the time the day is over, you still don't have a complete puzzle. But the goal in life should be to learn something, understand something, empathize with people. I want every student to apologize once a day to someone, and I want every student to say thank you once a day and express gratitude. Apologize for expressing a very end viewpoint or? No, that's, you should be rewarded for doing that. Mm -hmm. I want them to apologize if they've hurt someone or wronged someone. It's, it's, it's not only okay, it's liberating. Will you understand if you said something wrong? I know that I'm going back to uh, London after I'm here 
And I asked the gentleman, there's things I want to do in London. I only have a few days. And I gave them a list, gave this gentleman a list of four things I want to do. I realized after I sent the text that I just put an awful lot of pressure on him. So I need to apologize today for asking so much. It's good for him, but it's even better for me. We all teach pride. I see it in the posters. I see it in the troubles. I see it in the culture of country after country. Be proud of who you are. We should be teaching humility. Teaching people how little we actually know, how respectful we should be to our elders, to academics, to those who've experienced more than us and learned more than us. If we had a little more humility and a little less pride, we would have less conflict in this world. Indeed, indeed. So let's go back to polls. Let's talk about some of the political conflict um, that's happened in the United States over the last number of years. So we've had a raft of controversial elections from the presidential election in 2016. Um, again, to your credit, you were calling um, that there was going to be an upset in the election when everybody was calling it for Secretary Clinton, who is the Chancellor of this university, may I add. Um, what, I forgot about that. Yeah, Secretary Clinton's our Chancellor. Um, so we have a situation where the polls have called everything for Hillary Clinton, uh, and she did win the popular vote in fairness, but the algorithms, the computer power, the most sophisticated posters in the world got it wrong. And was it because Trump was so unpredictable, his approach was different? What went wrong back in 2016? It's the inability to measure a Trump voter. Okay. It had nothing to do with the algorithms, had, uh, with the exception of how you weighted your sample. An exit poll, you go to representative precincts, some that are overwhelmingly Democrat, some that are middle, some of them that are just barely Democrat and the same on the Republican side. So you have all these different, they often will go to, I don't know, a couple hundred different polling precincts and you take every nth voter, maybe every 13th, every 15th voter. The problem was Trump people were not participating. They would tell the exit pollster, no thank you, because they thought it was for CNN or the New York Times. They just didn't want to help the so-called mainstream media with understanding what was going on in the election. So in every possible way, the Democrats, it wasn't just the presidential race that was wrong. All the Senate races were wrong. The House races were wrong. They had completely underestimated the Republican total because so many Republicans did not participate. So when, the, when all the dust settles, Clinton was up four points more in the exit polls because Trump people didn't participate. We knew that the only way to fix that is to give people the reason to do it. Here's your chance to be heard. Your voice will be shared with members of Congress. Uh, you're going to have an impact by participating in this. We actually had to change the language of the questionnaire to get people to participate, and it worked. Um, but that was a fundamental mistake, and pollsters did not understand that until 2020. There were some polls within a week of Election Day that had Joe Biden be beating Trump in some of these swing states by 15 or 17 mm -hmm. points. Once again, yeah. they hadn't learned the lesson. It's not that people lie to pollsters. It's that they don't participate. So the Electoral College, we had a situation in 2016 where... The candidate who won the most votes did not get the presidency. Is it an outdated system? Well, that happened in 2000. Uh, that almost happened in 1968. We've had, uh, we've had in American history, I think, five elections where that has happened. The purpose of that is to ensure that candidates don't, don't just go to New York and Los Angeles and Chicago and Miami that they go to states all across the country. And I like the idea that you have to be able to appeal to voters as disparate as New Hampshire, which is in the Northeast, Nevada, which is in the Southwest, and you can't just do the population centers. If that was the case, then candidates would only go to urban areas. And if you lived in a rural area, farming area, 
small town, you would never see a presidential candidate and there would never be a campaign there. That's not good for American democracy. So tell me about social media and the role of social media it's in, in, in politics. It's, it's completely changed the landscape. It's changed society, but it's certainly changed politics. Is every future campaign going to be fought on social media? Not only will it be fought there, but all the periods between the campaigns. So it's a permanent campaign. We're arguing with each other morning, noon, and night. Weekdays, weekends, January, February, March, April. It used to be the campaigns would really get started around Memorial Day in America, at the end of May, and go through November. Now it's a permanent campaign, thanks to social media, thanks to it being so cheap. And the problem is social media rewards negativity, and it does not reward accountability or accuracy. And so, so much information that's being put out, and people do have the right. They do have the right to be wrong, but they're misleading or worse. And it is creating a society that doesn't trust anyone or anything. I'm not always a fan of, I use the example of the Washington Post because it is much more likely to run a story that's anti-Republican than it is anti-Democrat. I'm grateful for the Washington Post. I read the Washington Post. I read every story because I know that even regardless of the selection of stories, I know that there's accuracy there. There may be one side of the story, but they don't lie. Social media, and you can't always tell because it looks like a real publication, but they don't have to tell the truth and they often don't. So here I am. Is center right embracing the Times, the Post, the LA Times? Even, and I used to be critical of them because they are so much better than what you get online. Would Donald Trump have been president if there had been no social media? Uh, Donald Trump, oh, that's a good. I don't know. I, everything I answer from her, I try to get it right. And that's one where I would actually have to work it through over two or three minutes. I'm not going to waste the listeners' time with that. I, I, I'm not sure. I can't answer right now. I do know that his organization benefits tremendously from social media. And originally, Barack Obama was the first presidential candidate to capture the power of the web. But what he did in 20. Uh, 08 in the 2008 campaign is nothing compared to what Donald Trump did in 2016 and then again in 2020. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it does democratize news and information, but it also cheapens it. So for those who believe in freedom of speech, good for you. You get it on social media and everyone gets their speech on social media. No one's denied. But for those who cherish accuracy, accountability, personal responsibility, social media does not encourage any of those. And that's a problem in American society and it's a problem for democracy. So looking forward to the midterms, um, it looks the polls and obviously there's a health warning there. Uh, the Republicans are on course to take the House and possibly the Senate. Um, and if uh, predictions are right, possibly the White House again in 24. Are the polls right this time? Are we looking at the Republicans cleaning the board in November? Do we have Trump back in the White House? That's, I don't know if that's an accurate read of the polls. I, and by the way, I think we spend way too much time on them and not enough time on policy. I think we talk about the horse race rather than what the horses are actually saying. And that's a problem in American democracy. I know that in a country like Australia, it's out of control. The latest poll gets so much more news than a position on health care or the economy or taxes or whatever. There's too much reporting of it. There's too much focus on it. We have to do a better job with the substance. The polling is the style. It's the, it's the glitz. Uh, it's the sizzle on the steak rather than the steak itself. I guess here I should be talking about lamb rather than steak, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's, and we won't know if it's accurate until we get there. I believe if you read survey research correctly, you do agree that Republicans win the House, but you don't necessarily think they win the Senate on the individual races. 
the candidates are being nominated now in our primaries. The Republican candidates being chosen are not the best candidates to defeat Democrats. So I actually have gone against the grain, and I believe the Democrats will keep the Senate, even with a wave election, even with so many people coming out and saying, I'm mad about inflation, I'm mad about U.S. dependence on Russia, China, and other countries, I'm angry about crime, I'm angry about immigration, all those issues that benefit the Republicans. I still think the Democrats keep the Senate, because in the end, the candidates matter even more than the national mood. And does Roe versus Wade being overturned change the election? I believe it does. And I think it does in those suburban areas. The people who are most angry about inflation and most upset with Joe Biden are upper middle class women who had abandoned the Republican Party when it was run by Donald Trump and were considering coming back. And there's no way that they will return if abortion is still in jeopardy, That if, if the uh, right to choose is in jeopardy. It will convince more pro-life people to vote, but they're voting in districts where Republicans are already winning. I look towards those swing districts, which are very much suburban districts in some of the biggest cities in America, and I think it's going to be a net benefit for the Democrats. Looking forward then to the White House. Trump hasn't indicated he's going to run again, but all indications are that he will uh, from, from the wider point of view. Um, are we looking at Trump back in the White House in two years? I don't know how you spell it. I don't, I, I don't know what, what, if you were trying to transcribe this, I don't know what that sound would, would how you would write that down. Despondency. Uh, that's what my doctor says. <laughs> he says, I'm not depressed, I'm despondent. And there's a difference. Depression is clinical. Despondency is rational. And it's hard to see a brighter future. And it's how many, and you all went through decades of this. The difference is, and this is, and I give him the guy who checked me in credit again. I'm trying to tell him, I'm going back to that story of the gentleman who had his father murdered on the bridge. As I try to tell the story, the gentleman I'm trying to tell it to says there's something deeper. What is it? I said, it's a horrible story. He says, uh, there's something that, that triggered you. And my answer actually is, I don't want the U.S. I don't want Northern Ireland to have the same electoral system as the U.S. I don't think you deserve it. I think you should demand better. And I don't want these American differences to end up as violent as yours. And I, I'm so afraid that we're heading in that direction that I see more and more examples of people acting out physically and violently against those they disagree with. So there's a simple phrase, there but for the grace of God go I. I'm afraid that we're heading in the direction that you stumbled into in 1969. It's very worrying, um, extremely worrying. So on that, in terms of the polarization, uh, you would be described, whether you describe yourself as this, but you would be viewed um, within media circles as a liberal conservative. Um, what does it mean in the 21st century to be a Republican and a Democrat? I don't think those labels mean much anymore. Are you a Trump Republican? Are you a never Trumper? Are you progressive or liberal on the democratic side, I think that part of our problem is that we insist on labeling. I know in what I do, I'll ask you three or four questions. So if I'm just watching you, listen to you, I would be guessing that you were conservative, which is wrong. If I'm talking to you, I would have to push it to get any indication otherwise. Um, for those viewers who are, we'll see if you keep this in, this guy doesn't smile, ever. I'm smiling at the moment, just so you know. Yeah, that's the whole problem. He's smiling at the moment, I can't tell. Uh, you look like a conservative. Conservatives don't smile. Conservatives think the world's going to hell. Conservatives are just so negative. And progressives smile all the time with nothing to really smile about. 
I think the labels are horrible. I think it forces us into boxes that we really aren't. And my job with the students is to tell them how to get out of that box, to encourage them to climb out of that box, and to allow people to see inside it. I think if we're more candid with each other, more open with each other, more honest with each other, the conflicts inevitably go away. We have conflicts when we judge people and label them and immediately think whether it's their religion or their gender or their sexuality or their politics. When we label people, we are putting that box around them and that's not good for anybody. So on that theme, back to Northern Ireland, we're 24 years after the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. We had conflict here. We, we had 25 years of the worst conflict, which, which spilled over that time period. But we still have a situation where we're recording this on Election Day, where everything's seen through a binary conflict, nationalist versus unionist, thus or them. Um, a win for them means a loss for us. Um, if you were advising politicians here, or even the wider community, ordinary, ordinary citizens, civic society, to move beyond polarization and hostility, what steps would you tell them to take? First step is to see them as people, not as politicians. This university should take them away and this should become part of the process. It is such an important institution. It should be and has earned the right to be at the center of a better future for Northern Ireland. I would have you host the most open, honest, candid, intellectually aggressive conversations every month and the politicians would be told you have to come here because this is your future you cannot just speak to your constituency you have to speak to the country and the country is here within these walls second is that this university should sponsor an away day an away weekend where the elected officials and their spouses and their kids have to come and get out of politics, get away from this place. I'm familiar that one of the reasons why the Good Friday Agreement actually happened is that they were taken out of the environment in Northern Ireland. I didn't know that until yesterday. They went to South Africa, they went to the United States. That is brilliant. So you should host that. Get people out of their comfort zone. Get them out of that political realm. And when your spouse says, you know, that they're a wonderful couple. Or the kids get to know each other. You can't be mean. You can't be vicious. You can't rip people apart if you know their family. And you have time to do it right now. The election is today. You can make a difference in the next 100 days, in the future of Northern Ireland for the next 100 years. Take that opportunity. Make this podcast mean something by actually setting that up now. And you only have about 100 days to do it. Because once they get back into the system, they don't want to listen, they don't want to learn, and they won't open their eyes and they won't open their perspective. So just the final question then, in terms of where we're at, Northern Ireland has a global peace process that has been successful. Um, if you were advising the people of Northern Ireland in terms of reaching out throughout the world, reaching out across the Atlantic, particularly in the United States, um, what's, what's the message that we should send out as a community to attract FDA, to attract interest? Well, the first thing is for individuals, I would say that there should be a day that every, honestly, maybe, maybe, I got to think this through because maybe it's reinforcing the differences, but I would like to see Catholic families have dinner with Protestant families from a community. And Protestant families have a dinner with Catholics in the community. Were you the only Protestant in the, in the group of Catholics? And the same thing. And the moment they start to talk to each other, the moment that they break bread with each other, they realize that they are the same. They pray differently, but they pray to the same individual. They pray for the same things, even if the language is a little bit different. And as far as a global perspective, I teach at a program called NYU, New York University, Abu Dhabi. It's the most international program on the face of the earth. 84% of the students aren't Emiratis. 
84%. You can't sit in a group without a group of 10 students, without having eight of them from countries other than yourself, other than your own. I would raise the intellectual, the uh, international percentage of students at this university, which will raise the intellectual level. And I would set up programs, as many as you can, where the students from here go to as many universities as possible. And frankly, I because I believe in this place, I'm willing to help. You create those exchanges where the students of Northern Ireland get a chance to mix with the students from Austin, Texas, and Nashville, Tennessee, and Atlanta, Georgia, not just New York and Los Angeles. And you bring those students over here, the more they know of each other, the more respectful they will be of each other. The more that they have friendships across the globe, the less likely they are to participate in conflicts across the globe. And I learned this from a gentleman who himself was assassinated because he was too progressive as the two Germanys came together in the late 1980s. His last name is Roeder, and he was the last victim of Eastern European terrorism as he was trying to integrate East Germany and West Germany. He said to me, I want my son to marry somebody who isn't German because I want my grandkids to be truly global in perspective and global in scope. And I didn't understand at the time, and now I do. The more we know each other, the more we appreciate each other, the less likely we are to go to war against each other. Let's learn from this community, and you all learn from us, and we'll be a better place. And final, final question, Frank. Um, Good Friday Agreement obviously had a lot of American input. George McTill, the Clintons, um, we had Nancy Soderberg, and then further on down the line, Richard Haas came over to try and help support the parties through legacy issues. Where is Northern Ireland in the American political sphere? Is it still something that's relevant? Is there still a lot of soft power there? Or as time progresses, is that power diminishing? Northern Ireland is seen as trouble. It's a probably that you all call it the troubles because that's really how we, if we think of Northern Ireland at all, that's how we view it there are only a small percentage, perhaps less than 20% who have any idea that Ireland is still split. There's probably 15% that understand what happened here, even with the movie Belfast, which is very popular in America and a very powerful uh, cinematography. Uh, and that's not your fault, it's ours. We have so many internal conflicts now that we simply can't pay attention to things that aren't affecting us in our day-to-day -day lives, which is why that person-to-person -person contact matters so much. If you want and you have the right to want American support as you continue to move away from the violence and the divisions and the hatred of the 1970s and 80s, the only way to be relevant is to be present and the best way to be present is through human-to-human -human contact. And that's exactly what Queen's University can do. Well, on that note, Frank Luntz, academic, pollster, political communicator, and consultant to TV shows, thank you very much. It's, a, it's an honor. You've been listening to a Shaping a Better World program with Dr. Frank Luntz, hosted by Ryan Feeney. For more on this series, visit our website go.qub.ac.uk slash shaping hyphen pod. For the audio podcasts, subscribe to Queen's University Belfast Shaping a Better World podcast on all the main platforms and follow us on social media at QUB Engagement.